Okay, today we're talking about uh, neck pain. Uh, some objectives, so providing a differential diagnosis, treatment, management, and explanation of common and important causes of neck pain, including mechanical neck pain, degenerative diseases of the spine, neurologic causes, and refer to pain. So you'll need to be able to examine the neck pain from the perspective of the five models, uh, list indications and contraindications for OMM in the above conditions, understand the risks and benefits of OMT to the cervical spine, including HVLA, and also in your DSA uh, written, you'll have some relevant literature uh, that might be valuable for knowing some evidence-based usage for uh, manipulation of the, of the cervical spine. So neck pain is the 20th most common cause, uh, most common diagnosis in family practice. So um, not nearly as common as low back pain, but still significant. A lifetime prevalence around 70%, which is similar to low back pain. Uh, so most people will experience some significant episode of neck pain in their lives. After three months of non-operative treatment, 29% uh, had total relief of symptoms, 49% improved, and 22% uh, did not improve. So again, most people are going to have improvements or resolutions in their symptoms uh, without management within uh, three months. So if you have a 63-year-old uh, Female presenting to your office with a right-sided neck and shoulder pain uh, denies any injury or trauma. Uh, what history and physical would you like to know? So again, so working through how we gather information towards a differential. Uh, so you might ask, you know, when did it start? It started about a year ago. What makes it better? What makes it worse? It's worse with looking up. Um, ibuprofen seems to help. So the pain is sharp. It radiates into the neck and shoulder. It occurs most days and can be severe. Uh, so we got some of those background information. Uh, no injury, no trauma. So we got to use the information we have to be working towards our differential. Uh, so one way of looking at the differential is knowing the innervation. So neck, axial neck pain can originate from any tissue that receives innervation, including zygopophyseal joints, cervical disc, periosteum, neck muscles, dura mater, OA joints, vertebral arteries, degenerative, traumatic, malignant, infectious, or systemic inflammatory processes. Uh, so we want you to know your anatomy and know your innervations, and that can help guide your differential. And so again, the physical exam. When we do a physical exam, we are ruling in and ruling out uh, different differentials. So elements of a good physical exam of the neck, again, inspection, active and passive range of motion. You might want to include the shoulder and thoracic to, uh, to the proximity uh, to the neck. Strength testing. Neck, upper extremity due to the nerve roots. Neurologic, sensation, reflexes, palpation. Checking for bony tenderness, especially after trauma. Is there evidence of fracture? Tissue texture changes. Trigger points we've mentioned. So are there any trigger points that explain the neck pain? Uh, specific somatic dysfunctions uh, are, are also a good element of that. And not included in this, but to consider if you're history and exam or your history leads you to other causes of referred pain you know for myocardial infarction etc you want to widen your exam to include all of those things that you may be considering based on your complete history uh, so for this patient we did a shoulder exam and it was didn't show any uh, signs of shoulder injury the pain is worth with the extension of the spine you're asked if it radiated but it didn't radiate into the arms or fingers range of motion 45 degrees bilaterally which is a little decreased bilaterally reflexes two out of four of the biceps triceps and brachioradialis which is normal strength is five out of five in the upper extremities osteopathic exam c5 and uh, c6 our flex rotated side bent right there's a posterior tender point uh, located at C5 and rib 1 is superior on the right. Uh, so just a normal x-ray here just to review some of that arch of the atlas posterior uh, arch of the atlas and then spinous process is C2 you notice it's larger this C1 spinous process is often hidden under muscles big spinous process of C2 transverse processes coming out at us. That's why they're dense white. Um, and you want to make sure your vertebral prominence, C7. Again, you want to make sure you, see, you can see all the cervical vertebrae. Uh, so if you're missing C7, you can't rule out a fracture. So 
always want to count and make sure that all the vertebrae are included in your x-ray. So this is our our patient. Didn't quite look as pretty. We see some narrowing, uh, degenerative changes, narrowing around the foramina, narrowing the disc space, um, etc. Um, so again, so as we're working through ruling out red flags, so we asked about trauma, we could investigate if there prolonged glucocorticoid use due to uh, pulmonary problems or you know, some sort of autoimmune condition, age greater than 50, all those things might set you up for a fracture. Uh, those are things you can look at on the x-ray. Uh, infections or cancer, uh, history of cancer, unexplained weight loss, immunosuppression, IV drug user, uh, again age, fever is an indication of infection, cauda equina syndrome, more common in lumbar spine, but if you get a significant cord compression in the neck, you can get a lot of these symptoms as well. Neurologic, so we're looking for loss of sensation or strength uh, that could lead us to uh, cord or nerve involvement or a referred pain. We wouldn't want to miss uh, neck pain related to a myocardial infarction. So it can refer from the chest into the left shoulder, left side of the neck, typically have some of those other symptoms of shortness of breath, nausea, diaphoresis that you would find with a myocardial infarction. Uh, so you want to assess for cardiac risk factors if the patient presentation warrants. Uh, again, don't always, just because something's neck pain or a pain in an area, don't always think musculoskeletal. Uh, always have a wide differential to begin with, and then your questions and exam uh, lead you in various ways. But we want to rule out uh, these red flag findings, even if they're not as common, just to make sure we don't miss them. Uh, just another review of the anatomy of the cervical spine, specifically these uh, facet joints, back up and medial, and a coronal, or excuse me, um, an oblique plane. See how they're in an oblique plane here, uh, facing backwards, upwards, and medial. Facets this support a third of the weight of the head, so we talked about the degenerative process, so if there's degeneration of the discs and the joints, the arthritis uh, involved in that, more stress is placed on the facet joints and can lead to pain. There can be, uh, if there's wear and tear on that, ex excess force placed on the facet joints, you can get pain due to who, uh, this process, innervations of the medial branch of the dorsal primary rami and the spinal nerves. So that's why anything innervated by similar nerve patterns can have pain in the similar place. Back to that initial slide, you know, soft tissues, dura, joints um, can have similar pain patterns due to the innervation. Uh, so we would treat with OMT, exercise, pain medication. Sometimes you use facet blocks, which is just an injection right into that, uh, that joint to numb the area, or a radiofrequency ablation, also called a rhizotomy, uh, that actually burn the nerve uh, to that specific, specific facet joint. Uh, in order to reduce pain. But OMT can be helpful in that it helps, again, normalize tension. So if it can help normalize tensions, take some of the stress off that facet joint, you can improve pain as well. Here's that picture of the facet joint and that medial branch of the dorsal primary rami. Uh, that's, so that's the nerve they would block or uh, burn with a rhizotomy or radiofrequency ablation. And here's some referred pain patterns from a facet joint. Uh, so again, it could, you know, somebody's got a neck pain, posterior headaches, shoulder pain, any of that can be caused by uh, the facet. So knowing that radiation pattern can be helpful so you don't think, oh, it has to be a shoulder problem or it has to be a primary headache. Um, could be a cervical origin, even if the patient initially complains of pain elsewhere. Okay, another case, 42-year-old male in a motor vehicle accident yesterday. He complains of neck pain that started eight hours after the accident. The pain is tightness and stiffness in nature. He was struck from behind while stopped at a light. Uh, the car was estimated to be going at around 20 miles per hour that hit him. He was wearing a seatbelt. Airbag was not deployed. No loss of consciousness. Did not go to the ER because he didn't have any pain uh, at the time of the accident. His pain is worse with movement and does not radiate. So physical exam, you do range of motion. Uh, he's got 60 degrees of rotation, 20 degrees of side bending, 
multiple tender points to palpation of the cervical musculature, diffuse hypertonicity noted, rib 1 is elevated, the OA is extended, rotated right side bent left, the right temporal bone is externally rotated, no midline bony tenderness, reflexes are 2 out of 4 in the upper extremity, strength is 5 out of 5, and sensation is intact. So, you know, would you x-ray this person? Do you have to x-ray this person? Well, here's some guidelines um, so you don't overuse x-rays. Uh, so if after a trauma, if you got altered mental status, neurologic deficits, distracting injuries, uh, neck pain or tenderness, that's primarily bony tenderness if you're worried about fracture, and decreased range of motion of the cervical spine. You don't need to x-ray if the patient is alert, has normal conscious state, and has no distracting injuries, was not intoxicated, sedated, uh, no neck pain or tenderness, and has a normal neurologic exam. So just because they were in a, a fender bender doesn't mean you have to get an x-ray, especially in this patient. He had no pain initially and it came on gradually over time, no bony tenderness, neurologically intact, um, likely soft tissue injury as opposed to bony injury. So and when do you choose which test for an x-ray? Um, you can do an AP, lateral and open mouth view for suspicious for trauma. The open mouth is going to help you see that dens. It's going to check for alignment. However, around 20% of serious injuries are missed with plain film. So just because someone has normal x-rays uh, and you have a high suspicion based on your exam or the mechanism of injury, uh, you can order a, a, a CT scan. So that is going to give you a higher degree of sensitivity and specificity for a fracture than an x-ray. And an MRI is best to evaluate nerves, discs, spinal cords, occasionally soft tissue, whereas the x-ray would not be able to evaluate those structures. So when we do an x-ray of the, the cervical spine, we want to look for alignment of the uh, vert vertebrae. So we're looking at the anterior body of the vertebrae, posterior vertebral uh, body, and then this lateral, the margin of the lateral masses here. Uh, so doing that, you can draw those lines in uh, just to see if there's any deviations. It can help you identify a fracture. Um, so again, we talked about kind of trauma and when the indication of an, an x-ray. Other indications of x-ray would be age, if it's over 65, just because the risks of osteoporosis, compression fractures, metastasis, etc. Uh, trauma we talked about, high risk of osteoporosis, sensory or motor deficits, pain greater than six weeks. So this pain's not resolving, um, getting an x-ray is, uh, is indicated just to further evaluate the region. Progressive pain despite treatment. Uh, so you're doing the right things, you're treating conservatively, you're doing the right uh, treatment approach, you're not getting better. Uh, further workup is warranted. Night pain uh, can indicate cancer. Intense pain at rest, fever, chills, or night sweats. Also malignant processes, previous surgery. Um, so if they had a previous surgery in that area, you want to make sure the hardware and other structures are, are uh, not loose or uh, become damaged. If they have an abnormal bone scan, that could lead to, you know, could be cancer, could be multiple myeloma, could be other processes. If they have an unreliable history, if you're, you just can't get a good story of how this uh, neck pain came about, especially if there's a trauma involved, uh, it's good to err on the side of caution and metastatic disease. So let's apply that, those lines, uh, three lines of cervical spine imaging to this. So here's the anterior one, and as you can see, we get a little bit of a, a step off here. And let's do that posterior vertebral line. Once again, really see this bottom C7. Let's make sure it's C7. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeah, C7 uh, doesn't look right there, so that would be indication. You can see a fracture of C7. So using your how things are lining up can help you uh, localize those fractures. And the, the peg view, the open mouth view, can help you see the odontoid process. Here, you're checking joint spaces between C1 and C2 as your alignment issues. Uh, but again, this patient uh, likely has a cervical soft tissue injury uh, or whiplash. It's usually injury of the anterior longitudinal ligament, sternocleidomastoid, scalenes, or longus coli. So these are the structures that are strained with an extension 
uh, that's often caused with whiplash. So you may get associated tinnitus and dizziness. So the treatment is early mobilization and exercise, and the median time to resolution is actually 32 days, which is quite a, quite a bit of time. Um, Anti-inflammatories may or may not help. The evidence isn't great for them. OMT um, is a logical use uh, just because the, treat, the evidence supports early mobilization, and OMT can be a part of uh, mobilization of the tissues, decreasing hypertonicity and pain. So here's a kind of visual talking about those anterior neck muscles. So this is the sternocleidomastoid specifically, but imagine these other muscles as well. Uh, these muscles can get strained, micro trauma, inflammatory reactions. Uh, so our patient had uh, or earlier in the slide mentioned that you can have some tinnitus or dizziness. Well, think about your anatomy. The sternocleidomastoid attaches to the mastoid process of the temporal bones. The balance centers uh, in the ear are in that set in that temporal bone. So changes in the tension around the temporal bone can influence the ear and inner ear uh, related to balance and hearing. Just a reminder, the scalenes attach to those first two ribs, anterior and middle to first rib, posterior to second rib, longus coli, longus capitis. Um, again, so if they have, our patient had an elevated first rib, so you might end up treating scalenes, cervical spine, ribs as a part of a full treatment for that patient. And we mentioned the anterior longitudinal ligament which is located here. So this is the anterior surface of the vertebral bodies. Or you can see it he here as well a little bit. This is where it would run the anterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, so that can be affected as well uh, deeper uh, for a deeper extension injury. And that anterior longitudinal ligament is actually continuous with those discs. So there's tension on the disc influences the tension on the ligaments and vice versa. So again, we might end up treating neck, upper thoracic, ribs, along with those muscles uh, when treating uh, this patient to get full resolution of their symptoms. This is a reference from the Journal of Orthopedic Sports Physical Therapy, uh, talking about a grade A recommendation for cervical mobilization and manipulation. Uh, so thrust, non-thrust, uh, manipulation to reduce neck pain and headache. It's so also combining it with exercise is more effective uh, than either alone. Again, red flags, bony tenderness after trauma, loss of sensation along a dermatomal pattern, loss of strength, loss of reflexes, uh, neurologic symptoms that uh, are precipitated by the extension of the spine. So if they're looking back, maybe you're you're doing a posterior tender point or your check and range of motion and extension and they're like when I extend my neck I get uh, dizziness, um, you know, lightheadedness, etc. Uh, strange neurologic symptoms. This could be a problem with blood flow to the vertebral artery. Uh, so we want to be cautious of that and we may not want to do any sort of uh, high velocity treatment uh, to the upper cervical spine in that patient and that's what, why we don't do a full extension treatment and manipulation uh, with the thrust of the upper cervical spine. That's why we always are lifting uh, into flexion. Even though we may do a slight extension on a segment, we're not taking the neck into full extension just because of that extra strain it may place on the vertebral artery. So if you're doing any OMT and they start to complain of those symptoms, uh, stop and, and reassess uh, what you're doing. So again, relative contraindications to OMT. So a recent trauma without a workup, so you're you're not sure if there's a fracture there, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, or if you know of a fracture, you would be want to not want to do any sort of direct manipulation over that region. Any open wounds, skin infections, rheumatoid arthritis and Down syndrome, you need to know that so those are relative contraindications, perhaps even absolute contraindications uh, to upper cervical uh, thrust manipulation due to the uh, laxity of the ligaments around the dens. Um, so that's mostly with HVLA relative to absolute contraindication in those patients, especially if they have progressive disease uh, that would lead you to think they might have laxity in the dens. You wouldn't want to thrust and have that dens press into the spinal cord. So be aware of those contraindications. All right, next case. 
as a 47-year-old Caucasian right-handed male presented your office with progressive worsening neck pain for the last few weeks. It's now 6 out of 10 in intensity. Pain radiates from the base of his neck to his left elbow. It's accompanied by numbness and tingling. Pain is described as an electric shock. He denies any recent trauma, and um, over-the-counter medicines do not seem to help. On um, osteopathic exam, you notice C6 and C7 are extended, rotated side bent left, a tender point located below the left clavicle, lateral to the manubrium. Cervical extension and left side bending reproduce the pain in the left arm. Left arm uh, has a diminished bicep reflex and paresthesias over the upper arm without evidence of muscle weakness. Uh, so a spurling test is a good test to uh, screen for radicular symptoms. So you extend the neck, side bend to the affected side, add slight axial compression. So you might see side bending, you may see others with rotation, but we know there's coupled motion, so extension, side bending and rotation. Um, so that's going to narrow the lateral foramen. Increased radicular pain or numbness in indicates dis disc disease or foraminal stenosis. Um, so that's a way, that's a test to increase your suspicion for a radicular process, if that's positive. Uh, so recall how the spinal nerves travel slightly differently than uh, the rest of them due to this C8 uh, nerve. So C1 actually comes out above the vertebrae of C1, C2 above C2, and so forth. However, if they're due to, um, even though that anatomy is different, the rule is still the same as the lumbar spine in that the herniated disc is the higher number or the more inferior number. So, for example, if there's a herniation of C5 and C6, then the C6 nerve root is most likely affected. If C7, T1 herniation, then C8 nerve root would be affected. So the more inferior uh, nerve is affected. So again, similar outcome as the lumbar spine, but different reason. Whereas the lumbar, that's the same rule, but because of these nerves have to travel in f so far inferiorly to get to the right vertebral level. So always be looking for the nerve, uh, the most inferior nerve of the disc levels. So when assessing uh, reflexes, there's lots of times overlap, but the Bicep is used to assess C5, brachioradialis C6, tricep C7. And dermatomes, um, C5 can be this shoulder and, and inner arm, C6, thumb, C7, first two, or excuse me, second and third fingers, C8, uh, pinky, and inside of the arm, T1, you can get up into the, near the axilla. So knowing how those work, five, six, seven, eight. T1 when you're assessing sensory um, of the upper extremity. And so we have neurologic signs and symptoms on this patient. Uh, so we consider an MRI. This is a normal MRI. Notice this, the CSF is white. So we know it's a T2 because T2 and H2O water is white. H2O uh, so, that was, so we got a T2 weighted image, we've got the vertebral bodies, we've got the discs, uh, and you can see the cord is, is no pressure on the cord, nothing's interfering and pushing into the, the central canal. Contrasted with this image, we've got herniations of C4, 5, 5, and 6. You can see how that's pushing into the cord here, that's getting some pressure. You can see the surrounding fluid is being compressed. Uh, so we've got some significant herniations at these levels. And again, another really significant disc herniation posterior laterally here that's almost completely obliterating the, the nerve root, whereas this side's nice and open. Uh, this side is significantly compressed. And again, they most herniations most often concur, concur, excuse me, occur posterior laterally in the cervical spine, usually C5-6 or C6-7. So a disc bulge means the annulus is still intact. So the fibrous uh, outer layer, a disc herniation, that nucleus pulposus escapes. So we talked about sensory, we talked about reflex, and now strength testing. So the 
there's some overlap in these levels, but this is uh, we so we test multiple muscles to try to narrow that down. So for C5, we can use arm abduction or elbow flexion. C6, wrist extensors and elbow flexion. C7, elbow extension, wrist flexion, finger extension. C8, deep finger flexors uh, and the finger interossei eye, uh, the interossei eye. And uh, T1 is finger abduction. This is a nice chart kind of putting all that information uh, together for a neurologic exam. And that's uh, available in your DSA. So to recap, so herniated disc with radiculopathy usually is acute, severe incidence, sharp pain, and can be electric. Typically occurs along a dermatomal pattern, and you should have focal weakness, uh, or you may have focal weakness or change in reflexes of the involved uh, nerve root as well. So Sperling's test uh, is often positive. So compression and rotation toward the affected side, causing radiating pain down that shoulder. It's a sensitive test, but not not so very specific. So you could get a false positive. Just because they have a positive Sperling's test does not mean they absolutely have a uh, nerve root uh, impinged. Sensory loss along the dermatome, motor loss along a myotome, and changes in deep tendon reflexes. So you may not have all the findings of motor sensory and reflex, um, just depending on how much pressure is on the, the nerve, how long it's been there. Not all of the Reflexes and, and motor function could be inhibited uh, at once. So putting all that together uh, will help make your clinical decision. If you see any abnormalities, that's cause for, for investigation. The best diagnosis modality for a herniated disc is an MRI. So you can visualize nerves, discs, and spinal cord and see, um, again, just like in lower back, uh, pain, the connection between bulges or herniations of the disc, and pain is not entirely clear. So just because they have pain in a herniated disc doesn't mean the herniated disc is causing the pain. But if you've got neurologic involvement and a pressure on a nerve, then that, fix, uh, that fits uh, more accurately. You can use an EMG to assess nerve function, or you can do a CT scan if you're unable to do an MRI uh, if a patient has a pacemaker or has other uh, contraindications to MRI. So again, for nerve compressions, um, so neuro, neuralgic pain is usually lightning or electric associated with the dermatome. Uh, myalgic pain, so it's a different nerve root, the ventral motor nerve roots involved, and this pain is described as deep, boring, unpleasant, uh, poorly localized uh, because of the sclerotomal areas. Uh, so it can be autonomically mediated. Uh, because dizziness, blurry vision, tinnitus, uh, eye pain, facial and jaw pain. That has to do with the, where the um, sympathetic plexus is in relation to the nerve root. So that will help, again, divide it. Is it neural, neuralgic? Is it related to the nerve? Or is it new, to muscle or other soft tissues? So some of those things can, can lead you down one of those two paths. Speaking of um, muscle-related pain, We'll revisit those trigger points. This is the scalenes. So you can see if there's trigger points in the scalenes, that may cause a radiation of pain, even down into the fingers. Uh, but again, more likely dull, achy, not as often uh, sharp, electric. They shouldn't have reflex changes, shouldn't have strength loss, uh, as you may find with a nerve involvement, however. Here's some more trigger points. Levator scapula, trapezius, multifidi, splenius. So again, we can treat those with OMM, injections, or a spray and stretch, which is a cold spray, uh, followed by stretching of the muscles to break up that fibrotic trigger point. So this is the anatomy of the disc innervation. So it involves the innervation of the sinovertebral nerve. So there's formed by branches of the sympathetic plexus. And that all that this nerve supplies the 
annulus, posterior longitudinal ligament, periosteum, and epidural veins, and dura. So any, any of those structures, if they had some irritation, injury, or somatic dysfunction, can produce a similar pain pattern as a disc pain. Uh, so pain uh, is a symptom that we have to, to work through to figure out as close as we can what is the cause of the pain, and then we do a, uh, our treatment based on that. So again, discogenic pain, this is slightly different, but uh, similar areas as the facet pain. So this is a distinct, this is related to the disc, related to that nerve we just talked about, the sinovertebral nerve, but the radiation patterns are similar for C2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7. So can we do OMT for herniated discs? Uh, yes. So disc herniations are influenced by mechanical pressure of the vertebrae and the discs. So things that influence those mechanical pressures are posture, uh, muscle strength, compensation from somatic dysfunctions elsewhere, activity, mechanical tensions uh, due to related ligaments, muscles, joints, viscera, etc. So if we can improve the mechanical influences of the body and specifically around the the disc that's the problem, we can decrease the symptoms even if we don't cure the disc herniation. So again, if we can take just enough pressure off of those irritated segments to produce a clinically significant improvement in pain. But again, you'd want to be cautious about being direct. You'd probably want to avoid any uh, HVLA thrust just because that twisting motion uh, could potentially worsen the herniation, put more pressure on the nerve, and lead to a flare-up. Other management would be anti-inflammatories or steroid medications, muscle relaxants. You can some of your antidepressant class or anti-convulsant class of, of medicines works on the nerve level to help with pain. OMT and physical therapy um, can be important adjuncts. Epidural steroid injections uh, can be helpful. Again, if you've got a ridiculous uh, pain. That, that fits that pattern of a nerve root impingement. Just for neck pain in general, epidural steroid injections are, are, are not very effective. Uh, surgery, and only about 5% of people with uh, herniated discs require surgery. Uh, so again, a lot of them heal on their own. Uh, you can uh, treat conservatively in the vast majority of cases, assuming their neurologic deficits aren't severe or worsening. So next case, we've got a 60-year-old retired military man uh, with worsening neck pain. He admits to having off and on neck pain for many years, but this time it is constant and slowly progressing. In the past, he was told that he had early degenerative arthritis and several bulging discs on MRI. He also complains of some generalized tingling in his upper extremities, and he read on the internet that this could be thoracic outlet syndrome. His wife states that he seems to be more clumsy when walking uh, lately as well. So he got on the internet and he's already diagnosed himself, so easy job for the doctor, right? Well, let's see. So we do our uh, exam, the vital signs are normal. Strength is decre decreased in the upper and lower extremities, uh, which seems out of character for this guy. He seems like he stays in pretty good shape. Reflex, you have difficulty getting the upper extremity reflexes. You notice the lower extremity reflexes are a little bit hyper-reflexive, three out of four. Positive Babinski, positive ruse decreased vibratory sense in the lower extremity. Osteopathic exam, you've got some dysfunctions of the cervical spine, OA, SBS compression in the cranium, T1 to T4, and the right fibular head is anterior. So this is actually a case of cervical canal stenosis. Um, so this can be due to severe spondylosis, spondylolisthesis, disc herniation, or a combination. So you've actually got pressure on the spinal cord in the cervical region. So they have neck pain, usually kind of more of a gradual onset. The key is some of the upper motor neuron signs, weakness and spasticity, clumsiness, uh, maybe even their handwriting might be different, uh, gait disturbance, stiffness in the legs with walking, and you can't even get bowel or bladder incontinence if it's severe. So sim the sensory symptoms that are bilateral uh, actually arise from compression on different areas of the spinal cord. So if it's the spinal thalamic tract, you can get altered 
pain and temperature sensation, but light touch might be preserved. If it's posterior columns, that's going to be ipsilateral vibration and position sense, so maybe that's the gait disturbance. Dorsal root compression is uh, decreased dermatomal sensation. So again, so it's bilateral, it's not dermatomal, uh, that leads us to look at the spinal cord. A motor and reflex examination typically reveals lower motor neuron uh, signs at the level of the cervical lesions and then upper motor neuron signs below the lesions. So that's what we found in this guy. He had a little bit decreased strength and in, in reflexes in the upper extremity and hyperreflexia and Babinski in the lower extremity. And here's a just a picture of the spinal cord, so the posterior column. Uh, the dorsal root, um, so depending on which track was being compressed, they can explain the, the variation of symptoms you might get uh, in these patients. So again, a myelopathy is the spinal cord injury or spinal cord compression. So hand clumsiness, difficulty with balance, the more subtle complaints. Um, worsening handwriting, trouble buttoning shirts, those little aspects. If you start to think that it's a spinal cord, some of those specific questions uh, might become warranted and help help guide you. So you may have nausea and emesis based uh, related to equilibrium problems, um, paresthesias or dysthesias that are bilateral and not following a dermatomal distribution. So sometimes these are mistaken for peripheral neuropathy or carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, but Again, don't, don't jump to one diagnosis too quickly. Make sure all the pieces fit properly. As the disease progresses over time, you may get worsening weaknesses, intrinsic hand muscles, hip flexors, and then late manifestations include spasticity and bowel and bladder dysfunction. So our diagnosis would be MRI. Uh, the management is actually conservative in mild cases that are stable. Uh, was it physical therapy, osteopathic manipulation, maybe... Um, in, Epidural injections if you want to try to decrease irritation and swelling around the spinal cord. And surgery is indicated if they're progressing rapidly uh, or to prevent permanent neurologic damage. Uh, but a lot of times they're, they, they're pretty stable and slow progressing and can be managed conservatively. Just a reminder, contraindications to cervical HVLA, rheumatoid arthritis, and Down syndrome due to the laxity of the ligaments around the DENS. Um, and just a quick note on cervical HVLA, uh, you may hear people uh, or hear news stories about problems with cervical HVLA and aortic dissections, or excuse me, vertebral artery dissections. Um, so you need to know that many vertebral artery dissections occur spontaneously in the absence of manipulation, uh, but Again, there may have been associations with uh, manipulation. Since 1925, there's been 275 cases of adverse events reported. So that's the estimated risk of 1 in 400,000 to 1 in almost 4 million, uh, which isn't insignificant. Uh, you want to keep that in mind. So we talked about if they have these symptoms with extension or other history, um, you would want to avoid cervical HVLA. That's why we have lots of other ways to, to treat various dysfunctions. Um, so if, if the patient's uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable, the, you have suspicion uh, for underlying disease, you can definitely treat other ways. But just to put that in perspective, uh, approximately 13 million Americans use NSAIDs regularly, and 81% of GI bleeds related to NSAIDs occur without prior symptoms. So some research uh, in the United Kingdom has shown that NSAIDs will cause 12,000 uh, emergency room visits, admissions, and 2,500 deaths per year due to GI tract complications. And the annual cost of GI tract complications in the U.S. is estimated to be almost $4, mil $4 billion, uh, uh, with up to 103,000 hospitalizations and 16,000 deaths per year. So GI toxicity from NSAIDs, uh, with this set of numbers, and people can argue it, but it's an example, this makes GI toxicity 15th most common cause of death in the United States. Um, so no, hardly any medical treatment is without some risk. I uh, just wanted to lay out that information and contrast that with what would be a, considered a common treatment over the counter, ibuprofen, just to point out that there's um, that is not a uh, treatment without risk either. Uh, so that's why you're trained to uh, 
do a technique appropriately, diagnose appropriately, and choose the best intervention with the consent of your patient.